Before uh, getting started, allow me to say a little bit about myself. Jeff did a, a pretty good job. Uh, I am a neuroscientist and a philosopher, and I, pull, I appeal to methods from philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience to understand the mind. Uh, I have a general research program that investigates the foundations of reasoning, uh, in particular by applying principles from foraging theory. That's sort of the right side of the screen that you see before you. Um, uh, and I have another research program, which I'll be focusing on today, investigating the theoretical and conceptual foundations of cognition, in particular, the foundations of neurocognitive phenomena, cognition that results from brains. Uh, specifically today, I will present some of my recent work looking at neural computation, uh, asking questions like, what is neural computation? How does neural computation work? Um, how do neuroscientists infer computations in the brain, uh, and specifically uh, about neural manifolds. Uh, neural manifolds are being uncovered in many tasks across the brain that help explain cognition. Uh, what are neural manifolds? Neural manifolds are abstractions of neural trajectories, neurodynamical structure, often low dimensional and high dimensional neural activity. And what do neural manifolds do? Well, they do a lot of things. I'm going to be talking about two proposed roles, principally focusing on two proposed roles for um, neural manifolds in this talk. Uh, first, neur neural manifolds provide evidence for what is being computed by the brain. And secondly, neural manifolds provide evidence for how the brain computes. Uh, in addition to these two theses in my talk today, towards the end, I will argue that an examination of how manifolds compute will constrain conceptual accounts of neural computation. Um, looking forward to, to getting to those comments as well. Uh, so that's uh, generally speaking the plan. So let's dive into neural manifolds. What are neural manifolds? Uh, neural activity can be described as a high dimensional neural space as you see here on the left. You start with some part of the brain. A part of the brain can be described as a collection of neurons where the dimensionality of that part is the number of neurons and the value on each dimension is the firing rate, let's say, of that neuron. Uh, uh, call this the neural space. You can also use voxels and fMRI, the, um, uh, pixels and calcium imaging. There's a, there's a lot of different ways to conceptualize the neural space. And in this talk, I'll be conceptualizing it uh, as a, a, a set of neurons. Uh, the blue trace you see on the screen is a depiction of neural activity as it moves through this neural space. This is called a neural trajectory. Uh, the arrows are meant to indicate uh, the passage of time. So the uh, neural activity starts here and it sort of wends its way through that space, just like that. The neural space will contain many subspaces. These subspaces can be low dimensional, where low dimensional simply means lower than the dimensionality of the neural space. For example, a plane is a subspace of a volume or a volume is a subspace of a higher dimensional space. Here, the subspace is a three space contained in a much higher dimensional neural space call this the manifold space. Neural trajectories, which exist in the high dimensional space, also exist in this lower dimensional manifold space. Manifolds are abstractions from these neural trajectories. They're subspaces of the manifold space. For example, the manifold may be a line here, as you can see in this three space. Again, uh, these arrows indicate the direction of time. In some manifolds are abstractions from neural trajectories that are subspaces of a low dimensional manifold space contained in a high dimensional one. What is key is that manifolds are subspaces that are revealed by analyzing changes in neural activity over time. Manifolds can be represented using vectors. Each element in the vector stands for a neuron and the value of that element stands for the neuron's activation level. Then each such vector is a so-called basis vector for the neural space. The set of vectors whose weighted sums equal any other vector that represents the activity in the neural space. The neural space will contain many subspaces where each subspace is itself describable using a set of basis vectors that span the space. This includes manifold spaces. Every point on the one dimensional manifold then is equal to a linear combination of the three basis vectors that span the manifold space in this example that you see on the screen. I won't dive into how these sub subspaces are revealed, but a common analysis method is principal components analysis. So what are neural manifolds? Neural manifolds are abstractions of neural trajectories, neurodynamical structure, often low dimensional structure and high dimensional neural activity. Okay, so now we can turn to the next question. What do neural manifolds do? This is where uh, things get a, a, a little more interesting. Uh, I, I will argue that neural manifolds provide evidence for what the brain computes. 
Uh, they're being revealed in the brain across different brain regions and different task contexts. I'll illustrate this role for neural manifolds with the example of temporal interval estimation. Uh, while I'll only have time to present a single example, there are numerous uh, such examples, uh, especially in the last 10 years where it's really exploded finding this low dimensional structure and high dimensional neural activity uh, from a range of cognitive neurobiological research from the last few years, principally the study of single, multi-single neuron activity. So uh, recording from many individual neurons in the mouse or the monkey or even in humans and finding this kind of low dimensional structure. Uh, to illustrate the role of neural manifolds in providing evidence for what's computed, uh, I'm going to uh, present the temporal interval estimation task, uh, where monkeys estimate the duration of a temporal interval, uh, also called the ready, set, go task. Uh, in that task, monkeys had to recreate an interval that they experienced, the task sequence you see before you on the screen. Uh, so monkeys first fixate, and then a target in the periphery comes on. After that, the estimation period begins as signaled by a circle here around the fixation point. The end of the estimation period is the set point, which begins when the circle disappears. The monkey then indicates its estimate of the temporal interval it had just experienced um, here in the estimation epoch uh, by making a movement to uh, the target location. Uh, and that's the go uh, point. Uh, and that uh, period of time from set to go is called the production epoch. I'll now argue that manifolds provide evidence for what is being computed in the brain, in particular, um, the computational model that is monkeys are thought to implement to estimate these intervals. Uh, in other words, what function is being computed to generate some behavior? Um, but what counts as evidence for what's computed? Generally, physical systems provide evidence for what is computed if the proposed computation maps onto the behavior. The behavior maps onto the properties of the part of the system that's thought to perform the computation or the transformation from input to output, and the part maps onto the proposed computation. I'll illustrate this sort of evidence with the case study of temporal interval estimation that I just, uh, the task I just presented. Uh, and a crucial first step here is what was the computation for the task? A Bayesian computation was hypothesized for estimating intervals. Uh, to underlie this sort of temporal interval estimates. This model states that the estimates are influenced both by the experienced interval, but also by the prior probability of experiencing that interval. So this predicts that there will be a bias that pulls estimates of intervals towards the mean of the prior. So there were two different uh, distribution of intervals that were used, short and long. Uh, and uh, uh, in red here are the shorter ones and blue are the longer ones. And the extreme intervals in each distribution are estimated as being closer to their respective means. And that's what these arrows indicate. So the longer intervals in the short distribution are thought to be, are estimated. This T sub E is time of estimation uh, to be closer to the mean of the short interval distribution. And the shortest are thought to are estimated as being slightly longer as also being closer to the mean. And then there was a second um, distribution of long intervals. The interval, I should have mentioned this during the task, whether or not the interval that was to be estimated was drawn from the short or the long distribution was cued at the beginning of the trials for the monkeys. Um, and you can see the same sort of bias uh, should be evident um, for the long distribution uh, with the longest intervals in the long distribution uh, estimated as closer to the mean of that long distribution and the shorter intervals of that long distribution being estimated as longer than they are in fact, and 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 hence uh, closer to the mean. And that's what uh, this label bias means. So that sort of uh, uh, the output there is a estimate of the interval and that estimate of the interval is weighted by the prior probability uh, depending on whether or not it was a short distribution or a long distribution, um, as well as the likelihoods, the probability of, of experiencing that interval um, given uh, the distribution that the monkey was cued for. So the first criterion then uh, as evidence for what's computed is that the proposed computation, that Bayesian estimation, maps onto the behavior. The estimation, the proposed computation, predicts a bias in the behavior. And that's exactly what uh, was observed. This, uh, the estimates of the intervals 
that are at the ends of the distributions tended to be pulled toward the mean of the distribution. On the left here is monkey H, on the right here is the second monkey that they report the results from, monkey G, uh, and they both show the same S-shaped pattern as predicted by behavior. And so you can see that here. So for the short interval distribution, um, on the x-axis here is the time of the interval, the real time of the interval, and the y-axis here is the estimated time of the interval. And you can see that um, just as an illustration, for the short interval uh, times for monkey H, the shortest times were overestimated. They were estimated to be longer than they were, in fact. Um, and the longest times were underestimated. They were estimated to be shorter than they were, in fact. Um, uh, in other words, they were pulled towards the mean. So you see this, this bias, and you can see that in these insets as well, uh, these sort of characteristic or hallmark sigmoids. And you see that um, for both monkeys. So uh, the Bayesian computation uh, maps the bias in estimates of the interval. It maps onto the behavior. Uh, but what of the behavior part mapping? Well, in order to understand how the brain gives rise to this interval estimation, recordings from the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex during the task were performed, and they were subsequently reduced during principal, uh, using uh, principal components analysis, and neural activity was projected into the space formed from the top three principal components, revealing a one-dimensional curved manifold. Uh, there was one such manifold for each range of intervals, the longer intervals on the screen here in blue and the shorter ones here in red or orange. Uh, this finding revealed the first neural computation during interval estimation, the formation of a representation of elapsed time by the neural trajectory traveling along the manifold. So here you see the behavior uh, maps onto the properties of the part. Uh, for uh, longer intervals, uh, there was uh, a longer manifold. For shorter intervals, there was a shorter manifold, a shorter uh, distance through neural space that the neural activity tended to travel. So the position along the curved manifold maps the estimate of the interval. Finally, uh, does the manifold map onto the computation? In short, yes. Uh, to illustrate, the manifold maps the different inputs to the Bayesian computation. For example, the length of the trajectory varies in relation to one input, which is the elapsed time, and the manifold it travels along varies in relation to another, which was the prior distribution, whether it was short intervals or long ones. Again, long in blue, short here in orange. Uh, changes to the input result in different transformations or, or neural trajectories through, through this manifold space in length or along a different manifold. This in turn suggests certain functional tests, for example, of the computational role of these manifolds. For example, changes in the initial conditions and in manifold space should change the output and should also change the manifold. And changes in the inputs to the manifold space should also change the output. Um, the principal study I'm reporting these results from are, are from the Jezieri Lab at MIT. It's this really beautiful paper, the Sohn et al. paper from Neuron from 2019. There's another beautiful paper I believe it's also a neuron from 2019, Remington et al., um, who confirmed those predictions in a task very much like the ones I'm reporting today. In addition to the sort of input mapping uh, from the computation onto the part, the manifold, uh, the output operations, which I'm going to discuss in a moment in, in the second for the second computation that I'm going to analyze and present in this talk, um, uh, also mapped those outputs. Um, and, and in that mapping, the manifolds mapped onto the properties of the computation. So in sum, uh, the part, uh, the position along the curved manifold maps the Bayesian computation. In sum, the Bayesian computation maps the bias in estimates of the interval, the position along the curved manifold maps the estimate of the interval, and the position along the curved manifold maps the Bayesian computation. It also gives rise to that bias. So the three-way mapping is present, and consequently, the manifold is evidence for what's computed, namely, in this case, the Bayesian estimation of these temporal intervals. Now, that's only evidence for what is computed. Uh, my next thesis is that manifolds are also evidence for how the brain computes. So let's turn to that next. Uh, I contend that manifolds are evidence for how something is computed, in particular, in this case, for how the Bayesian estimate is computed uh, by neural activity. Uh, a second computation revealed on the temporal interval estimation task illustrates how manifolds are evidence for how something is computed in the brain. The second computation was a projection 
from the manifold onto what they called an encoding dimension. This encoding dimension was simply the vector described by the line that connected two points on the manifold, the point corresponding to the shortest interval to be estimated in a distribution and the point corresponding to the longest interval uh, in, in the distribution to be estimated. This encoding dimension, uh, sorry, uh, the geometry of projecting a curve onto a line is compression of the lengths of the arcs along the curve that correspond to segments of the line. So you can see here, so for the shortest uh, uh, interval in the distribution, if you can project that curve onto this line, you get a, a shorter length. Whereas if you project one that's sort of middling along the curve, you get a longer estimate. So you have this, this compression of the lengths that are in the, along the extreme parts of the curve. And that gives rise to this bias in a particular fashion. How does this result in shorter or longer estimates? This computation can explain the observed behavior um, because of the nature of the neural activity that was observed during the production epoch when the monkeys were waiting through the amount of time that they estimated to match the interval that they'd experienced. Uh, so on the right here is a depiction of neural activity during that production epoch. Um, this is when the animal reports its estimate by waiting an amount of time. So the colors match here. So for the longest distribution, you can see that neural activity tended to travel along a particular manifold. Uh, but unlike these one-dimensional manifolds here, what you can see is there's sort of this curved two-dimensional manifold that's traced out by these different uh, neural trajectories. Um, they are well-ordered, so the shortest um, uh, intervals that were estimated uh, correspond to this trajectory here, which was furthest down that two-dimensional curve, uh, curved plane. Um, and then the longest ones were here near the top. And in fact, there were differences in the neural speed. So the neural activity, which started at this set point when, when the animal had to begin their estimation of the interval, um, was fastest for the shortest interval. The neural activity passed through this uh, manifold space more quickly for these shortest intervals, and they all ended uh, near the same spot, this go point when the animal made the movement to indicate the end of the epoch, uh, excuse me, the end of the interval that they were estimating. Um, whereas the, the longest intervals, these light blue ones, the neural activity was the slowest. And it turns out that um, uh, this vector projection operation of projecting a curve onto this encoding dimension correlated with uh, the speed. Uh, and so, um, uh, so this constitutes evidence of how the brain computes, uh, which I believe is uh, right here. Uh, so uh, the differences in the input to the vector projection give rise to differences in speed. And that's what you see here on the right. Um, so here on the x-axis is the projection on the, onto the encoding dimension u again. And on the y-axis is the speed through that, uh, that manifold space along that curved two-dimensional manifold. And there's this law, like there's this correlation um, where um, the greater the projection onto u, um, the faster the speed, or in this case, the slower, excuse me, the slower the speed, because those are the longer intervals. And so the neural activity was slower. What's interesting about this is it, it projects it in a law-like way. So um, the uh, further along you are on this manifold, the greater the speed, uh, uh, sorry, the less the speed that results from that projection. And so uh, for example, if you're in the middle, if you are, if the monkey experiences an, an interval that's uh, sort of from the middle of the distribution, uh, then the shorter intervals where neural activities, uh, neural speed is faster, uh, it should be slower than that, but it also will be faster than the longest intervals. And that's exactly what you see. And so there's this preservation in the, in the projections of the relations between the speeds, between the output of the computations um, and the properties of the manifold and the, and the proposed computation of vector projection. Um, so manifolds provide evidence for how something is computed because points on the manifold map onto inputs and points on the manifold or in manifold space because of the vector projections map onto outputs of the computation and the relations between inputs and outputs of the computation 
have corresponding relations between points on the manifold or in the manifold space. So there's this, uh, what's called a homomorphism, which I'm going to turn to uh, a little bit later, which is this preservation of relations. There's a relation between the outputs of the proposed computation, um, and th there's a corresponding relation in manifold space that preserves those relations, which is called a homomorphism. Before uh, diving deeper into the homomorphisms, um, I want to defend this, this uh, sort of mapping as um, a reason to think that manifolds provide evidence for how something is computed. So let me address some objections uh, that reject any special role for manifolds in providing evidence for what or how the brain computes. Uh, first, you might think that these computations are merely the result of single neuron activity. Uh, in other words, all this evidence is no different from the evidence that can be gathered from understanding how single neurons function in the brain. On the neuron account of computation, input spikes from other neurons are received in the dendrites, transformed by the cell body into output spikes, and those spikes are transmitted down the axon to other neurons. This account appears in countless studies in cognitive neurobiology, so I don't want to impugn this account, um, but I do contend that this account doesn't um, uh, explain away the evidential role of manifolds for uh, neural computation. Uh, here on the screen, you see an example of an account uh, that explains how monkeys make decisions about fields of randomly moving dots. For instance, one computation in this processing flow of information, so here's random dot motion stimulus, it goes uh, in through the uh, eyes into the brain, gets processed in the lateral geniculate nucleus and then V1, and then gets passed on to area MT uh, for motion processing. Um, and you might think uh, that, uh, and then um, there's a series of operations that get passed on to area LIP, the lateral ulnar parietal area, and then passed on to choice selective regions for determining what the direction of motion is. Now, one computation in this processing flow involves spike output from neurons in areas MT, coding for motion direction being passed on as input to neurons in area LIP. Neurons in area LIP then integrate this input over time, uh, inhibit other neurons, that's um, what this cross inhibition is here, with different motion direction preferences, and then output spikes that correlate with the integrated motion evidence. Um, so this is a good example of how this kind of single neuron processing flow uh, can explain cognitive functions in this case um, decision making about uh, noisy uh, in an, uh, about the direction of motion of a field of noisily moving dots um, and again I don't want to impugn this account but I think it's insufficient to explain computations with neural manifolds and let me say why the main problem but far from the only is that single neurons are one-dimensional and consequently can't span a greater than one-dimensional space of course, sometimes manifolds are one-dimensional as well. So in fact, the trajectories I showed earlier in the manifold three space during temporal interval estimation were one-dimensional. They were just these curves. Um, but manifolds are sometimes bigger than one dimension. For example, the two-dimensional manifold and the response epoch that I showed, um, where you have this nice orderly separation of neural trajectories in the manifold space uh, that correlated with um, the animal's responses and estimates of the intervals. Now, perhaps one neuron is not enough for, for each dimension of variation, like a two, two dimensions of variation. There might not be, uh, a, there uh, a may be a dedicated neuron or dedicated population of neurons that can encode the same information as that dimension of the manifold and even explain the presence of the manifold. The suggestion then becomes that all these manifolds and computations are merely the result of population activity. You can even say there's one dedicated neuron for each dimension of variation. After all, manifolds and manifold spaces are spanned by these basis sets I talked about earlier, these basic ways of manipulating neural activity, and perhaps those bases correspond to the single neuron activation functions. However, different population patterns can result in the same manifold. In other words, different patterns of spiking activity across the population results in the same low, dyna low dimensional dynamical structure. In other words, the neural trajectories uh, whose, whose abstractions are the neural manifolds. This implies that there are not dedicated neurons that encode the manifold dimensions because there's, two, there's the, a variety, a diversity uh, 
of population activity patterns that can give rise to it. Now, in rebuttal, it might be thought that even though there's different population patterns that can result in the same manifold, there are equivalence classes of such patterns, and it's those equivalence classes that are, that are the right description for explaining um, computation in the brain and also for explaining the evidential role of manifolds. However, population equivalence classes aren't the right type of thing to transform inputs into outputs or to structure dynamics. In other words, they're not the right type of thing uh, for playing that evidential role. At any given time, only one element of such a class is present in a given system. And further, which pattern gives rise to the manifold may change from trial to trial, during a trial, and certainly varies across brains. So the equivalence classes won't do the trick either. Now, it might be thought that the dynamics of the population are what is in common across the members of the equivalence class, and it's those dynamics that explain the computation and the presence of the manifold. But this simply collapses into the manifold view, since manifolds just are structure in those dynamics. Uh, you might further object that these populations have some other property in common, such as their weight matrix. So in, in neuroscientists, when they're describing these population patterns of activity, they think about them as though there's these uh, this big weight matrix of connections between the neurons, uh, and you can explain neural activity over time as dependent upon uh, those connections and the weights that describe those connections between neurons in the population. However, the weight matrix is also not sufficient because there's different numbers of neurons and different sets of weights that are sufficient for the same manifold. Now, uh, you might again think that, okay, that's fair, but different weight matrices, even potentially with different numbers of neurons, uh, might have something in common, such as that they give rise to these the, the relevant neural dynamics, and that's what explains the evidential role of manifolds. But again, this just collapses into the manifold view. Uh, and similar point applies for other, feature, other features of, of neural populations, for example, noise correlations. Okay, uh, so uh, it really does seem like neural manifolds play this important role that can't in, in providing evidence for what's computed and how. As I illustrated with the case of temporal interval estimation, uh, neural manifolds play the role of what's computed as evidence for what's computed in that case, namely this Bayesian estimate of the temporal intervals. And they also play a role as evidence for how uh, that uh, compute, uh, the brain computes. In the case of temporal interval estimation, that was analyzed into a series of computations, including a vector projection operation. And the orderly relations of the manifold and the way that um, the, manif the point in manifold space, uh, when projected on the encoding dimension, predicts uh, the neural speed through the subsequent production epoch. And in particular, the preservation of those relations between the proposed computation, the vector projection relations, and the manifold space relations, um, uh, the mapping between those relations suggests um, that manifolds can also provide evidence of how the brain computes. Now, I've been very careful here, uh, and through a, a long and, and, and challenging series of, of presentations, many times I've presented this, to uh, couch my claims in terms of the evidence that manifolds can provide. Um, but there is a deeper, uh, perhaps more interesting, certainly more tantalizing hypothesis um, that I'd like to suggest and briefly discuss, which is uh, the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis. Uh, and what this hypothesis says is not only do manifolds provide evidence of what the brain computes and how, but in fact, um, trajectory on neural manifolds is in some sense uh, a computation in the brain. And the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis roughly, uh, as you see on the screen, roughly states that points on manifolds map onto inputs of computations. Points on manifolds or in manifold space map onto the outputs of computations. And the relations between pairs of inputs and outputs described by computations map onto relations between pairs of points on manifolds or points on manifolds paired with points in manifold space. Now, I haven't stress tested this uh, fully yet, um, and I'm sure there's holes, but I think this thesis will capture um, uh, not only the role that, uh, that manifolds play as evidence for what the brain computes and how, but actually can provide um, an analysis of what, in some sense, neural computation is, at least in certain cases. 
um, because I don't want to deny that um, for certain cases, single neurons might in fact be the computational implementation or substrate. Um, there is one objection I'd like to address uh, before discussing some of the ramifications of this hypothesis. Um, while the role of manifolds as evidence for what's computed is consistent with both realism and anti-realism about manifolds, anti-realism about manifolds is inconsistent with the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis, the one I just presented, which maintains that neural computations are travel along manifolds. They are identical to these trajectories. So the anti-realism objection rejects manifolds as ephemera of our data analysis methods. They might just be data models or just the result of various dimensionality reduction techniques like uh, principal components analysis, as I presented earlier, um, which revealed those trajectories along manifolds and uh, either the, the curve manifold for the representation of the estimates or the two-dimensional uh, manifold, the curved plane during the production epoch of the uh, estimates of the temporal intervals. Um, uh, manifolds may also be merely abstractions, for example. But I think that um, even if they are abstract in some sense, they might still help perform computations. And more fundamentally, um, manifolds may be emergent or otherwise irreducible to underlying population activity. In short, it's you can't assume that the manifolds aren't real. It, there's an additional burden that uh, the objector takes on to reject a realistic interpretation of neural manifolds. Um, and I think, you know, as a knee-jerk reaction, which I've gotten before in presenting the hypothesis, um, merely rejecting neural manifolds out of hand doesn't do justice to their potential reality, to the fact that they might be these emergent dynamical structures in the brain. But as I said, um, it's early days for the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis. Uh, defending it uh, would require a, a much more substantial treatment. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, I think it's interesting to explore the ramifications of the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis. Um, and what we can do is we can sort of canvas some of the various theories of computation that are out there. And we can say, well, given this proposed hypothesis about uh, manifolds and their role in neurocomputation, uh, what implications does it have for these various accounts? Um, so uh, I'll now turn to a brief discussion of how the hypothesis might constrain accounts of neural computation. Uh, one widely accepted analysis of computation is based on states. It's sort of an input state output analysis of computation. A physical system implements a computation. If there's some mapping between pairs of inputs and states and states and outputs, and these mappings are in turn mapped onto physical input and physical system state pairs, and physical system state and physical output pairs. A good example here, which I won't read, is on the screen. This definition is from Dave Chalmers. Um, it's it's there are well known problems with what the so called mapping approach, um, but it's, it's it's certainly at the heart of of several accounts of computation, including accounts of computation for cognition or computation in the brain. So note right away that this just is not anything like the computational explanations uh, I outlined and illustrated with temporal interval estimation uh, that rely on manifolds. Those trajectories don't appear to rely on these sort of state-to-state -state transformations. Saying why is more difficult than the intuition suggests, because across different manifolds, such as the transformation from the estimation epoch uh, one-dimensional manifolds to the production epoch two-dimensional manifold, uh, may involve state-to-state -state changes. Um, in fact, those shifts may involve changes um, in manifold space altogether. Um, but certainly, uh, another point I'll note is that part of the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis is this preservation of the relations, this homomorphism uh, that's required for neural computation, and that um, uh, requirement is absent from the input state output analysis of computation. So, this analysis would be insufficient um, on the basis of the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis. Computing generally refers to input to output maps, um, which is far too general. Other accounts appeal to programs. As Cummins says, uh, to compute a function is to execute a program that gives uh, some output on some input just in case um, the function's uh, output for that input uh, is O. 
Computing reduces to program execution, so our problem reduces to explaining what it is to execute a program. Program execution involves steps, and to treat each elementary step as a function that the executing system simply satisfies. To execute a program is to satisfy the steps. But it's not obvious that the foregoing, the for example, the example of temporal interval estimation can be described as program execution either. Suppose programs require states, then the view just collapses into the input state analysis um, that I presented a moment ago and has the same problems. Uh, now, there might be some other ingredient here. Uh, Cummins mentions um, a, a step satisfaction, uh, and there's elementary steps that's often uh, thought to involve rules in some sense. Uh, but again, it's not clear that the example of manifold computation utilizes rules or steps and may be described as if uh, there's a rule or step, perhaps that mathematical operation, but certainly there's not an iterative stepwise algorithm that's being implemented. Finally, I'll note that this input output analysis of computation of program as program execution, do, again, does not require that homomorphism, that preservation of relations in the com computed domain by uh, corresponding or, or relation uh, by corresponding relations uh, in the implementation implementation. There is an account out there, Orrin Shagrir's account, that does involve a homomorphism like that. Uh, uh, this is the modeling analysis of computation. Uh, Shagrir says that a physical system P is a computing system just in case there's input-output mirroring, the input-output function of a given process in a physical system preserves a certain relation in some target domain. Uh, there's a mapping from the physical process uh, to the target domain that maps the function to the relation, um, the input to some part of the physical domain, uh, the output to some other part of the physical process, excuse me, the physical system, uh, such that uh, if the function has for some input a particular output, um, then the corresponding physical system state pairs stand in that relation. Uh, then he says this means that the function and the physical relation share some formal relation f. And I'm going to turn back to that in a moment. That's the first condition. The second condition for com computation is the implementing condition, uh, the process, the physical process of the system whose input output function is G as some function implements a formalism whose input output abstract function is that formal relation F. And finally, he has a representing condition. The input variables uh, of the physical system represent the entities of the target domain and the output variables of the physical system represent the entities of the target domain. Uh, so there's two major problems here. First, consider the first condition. This says that the relations of the input output function and of the target domain are mapped. So far, so good. That's just the homomorphism. But Shogur then says that the two relations share some formal relation. In other words, the same function describes a relation between states of the physical system and states of the computation. But this seems false because some functional relations between physical system states simply don't stand in a counterpart relation in the states of the computation. For example, different lengths of, different, of temporal intervals stand in longer than and shorter than temporal relations, but the manifold states, which have the best claim to satisfy the modeling account, don't stand in temporal relations, rather they stand in manifold spatial relations. Now, the notion of formal relation that Shagrir appeals to here is not defined, so there might be some wiggle room. But his example of oculomotor integration implies a strong notion. He says our oculomotor integrator maps certain neural inputs to neural outputs, and this mapping input-output process mirrors the relation between movements and positions of the eye. They both share the mathematical relation of integration. In other words, the physical system states stand in an integration, mathematical integration relation, and the positions of the eye stand in a mathematical integration relation. But there's not an identical mathematical relation shared by the curved manifold and temporal intervals estimated by the Bayesian computation, for example. Likewise, there's no mathematical relation shared by the, um, uh, the correlation between position along the encoding dimension and the neural speed, and the input and outputs of the vector projection. So the first condition under that strong notion of a formal relation seems false, but I admit that there might be a weaker notion of formal relation 
um, that under which uh, Chauvier's account is pretty good, uh, count is pretty good, except for that third condition. That third condition says that the states of the physical system must represent states in some other domain. But the computation to estimate intervals involved setting a variable, the neural speed, the second computation, that vector projection operation. That variable, neural speed, however, does not have representational content in the domain of temporal intervals. So it seems like the representing uh, constraint is false. Um, so the takeaway then is that there really are not good accounts that I've been able to find of neural computation that are detailed enough to capture the homomorphism, but not um, uh, but not so strict as to require identity of the relation uh, under some description. Um, and so I think that there, um, I think Chagrier's account is pretty good. It's pretty close. Um, and so I suspect that uh, a minor modifications of his account might be able to handle the neurocomputational manifold hypothesis. Okay, so uh, in some different mappings provide evidence for different things. Mapping the implemented computation in the physical system onto the behavior provides evidence for what is being computed. Mapping the physical system onto the computation provides evidence for how the transformation from input to output works um, and further suggests the neural computational manifold hypothesis that you see here again on the screen. Um, in summary, manifolds are abstractions from sets of neural trajectory and are structure in neural dynamics. Uh, manifolds are evidence for what and how the brain computes. Um, and uh, suggestively, because uh, I didn't have time to really provide a robust defense, uh, manifolds may constrain accounts of neural computation uh, in the form of the neural computational manifold hypothesis by requiring a certain sort of homomorphism uh, in order for uh, a physical system uh, to uh, perform a neural computation. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm happy to take questions.